Well, welcome to Phoenix uh, Seventh Day Baptist Church. <laughs> so glad you're here. My name is Jim. Um, I'm a pastor in uh, California, uh, the next state over, and uh, and uh, um, from Foothill Community Church there. And uh, they've asked me to come and share on this day. Um, so we from and we brought some people with us from Foothill, and so we are happy to be here and to. Uh, 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 sharing this day with you. Um, I I actually brought notes for the, and I don't know if everybody grabbed them or not, but they're in the back there, for my message today. <clears throat> and um, anyway, I just, I I use notes because it's just something that I've, I've learned to grow accustomed with, people having things that they can actually follow along Instead of just listening to a talking voice, you have something you can actually do during the during the sermon. You can doodle, or you can uh, actually fill in the fill in blanks. <laughs> um, we have been going through the Book of Romans in uh, and at uh, uh, Foothill, and um, and we're uh, in when we were in chapter eight. Uh, this uh, I I was. Going through this in chapter, we're in Romans chapter 8, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Chapter 8, verses 18 through 27. <clears throat> the thing is, as I'm getting older, um, I find that I'm groaning a lot more. I groan when I sit down and I get up too quick. I groan when I stand up and I have to sit down. <clears throat> I... Um, I groan if I eat too much. I uh, I groan if I tweak my body uh, too far. I groan when I see stuff on TV. Sometimes I just go. Oh. Uh, I groan when my wife tells me, "Jim, I think the the washing machine's going out." I groan a lot when I play golf. And I groan when there's a Prius that pulls in front of me. In verses 18 through 27 of verse 8, uh, Paul talks about groaning three times. He talks about creation groaning, that we groan, the Holy Spirit within us groans. And, um, and I want to explore this thing about groaning today, even during this, uh, this, this Sabbath here in Phoenix. But let's put our passage into perspective. And so in chapter 17, this is what Paul says. Paul says, and you have it there in your notes. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider our present suffering not to be uh, worthy, worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul's been talking in this uh, chapter a lot about what the the privileges and what a rich privilege it is to be a child of God, to be one of God's kids. However, in the midst of this privilege that we have, they're suffering. They're suffering with just the, the process of life and the things, the sorrows that we go through uh, in this season of life, we had just uh, uh, two people in our uh, uh, congregation um, just go home to be with the Lord, and so and my and my own father right now is is in a place where I think probably the next couple of weeks he's going to be, you know. <laughs> anyway, he's going to be going home to be with the Lord. So, but. Not only that, those are just, it's just stuff that happens in this life. It's, it's what we walk through. But also just being a Christian in a world that rejects God and Christ, that's part of the suffering that we go through also. And that first fill in there that you have is, is there is a cost that comes with following Jesus. There's a cost that comes with just following Jesus. And, and it's important to understand that as, as Christians, it's important that we realize that there's a cost, that one, when we come to Christ, 
when we turn our lives over, Jesus then say, okay, now everything will be fine. Everything's fixed. Everything's wonderful now. Your bank account's full. You don't have to worry about it anymore. No, yeah? no, it doesn't happen like that. We still have to. We still deal with stuff. We still, we 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 we, we still. Jesus doesn't take all our problems away, even though we're set free from the condemnation of sin and and death. God's people, we are uh, still in conflict with the world that we live in. You know, even though as Christians we're living here in the United States, we probably won't be uh, uh, pers- prosecuted or persecuted or executed like they are in other countries, but still we face ridicule and, and we're going the opposite directions often, oftentimes of this world. And how do we stand in times like this when all of a sudden we, 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 we see the world going one way and we just go, that's just not right. Well, Paul tells us that we need to look to the future. That's how we stand. We stand looking to the future. He doesn't tell us that everything that you suffer, everything that, that, that happens to us here on this earth, you'll get that privilege in heaven. He says, no. The stuff that we're going to get into heaven makes what we are dealing with down here minuscule as far as God is concerned. He says, man, when you look to heaven and what God has for us there, he says, this stuff we're facing here is like a little speed bump in just our journey. Because that's where we that that that's that's what where we're going as believers in Christ. And I think. Paul, Paul says, you know, it's a good trade. It's a, it's a good trade to surrender what you cannot keep in order to gain what you cannot lose. It's better to give up the trinkets of this world and say, God, I want to store for myself treasures in heaven. And I think that whole thing of, of storing treasures in heaven is what gets Paul on this whole idea of groaning. It starts him on this whole idea of, of groaning when he starts thinking about heaven. And the first thing he says there is groaning of creation. He says, creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of one who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into glorious freedom of the children of God. And we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Paul says that created the created world is groaning for the day of salvation. The world around us is groaning, wanting to be set free and say, well, why is it not set free? I thought creation, man, I, I, I look around, I see beautiful sunsets, I see real pretty, you know, skies and waterfalls and other things. This is beautiful. But realizing that one creation, what we see now is not what God intended it to be. Not what God intended it to be. It says that, that one, that creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it. In other words, when sin entered into the world, when Adam sinned, when Adam sinned, the entire creation was thrown out of balance. It was all thrown out of balance. <clears throat> Do you remember way back in the book of Genesis? In verse, uh, we're, we're in verse chapter 3, verse 17, where Adam said, where, where he said to Adam, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife. It's a pregnant pause. No, because, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, that which I commanded you, you must not eat. First is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Because Adam sinned, the ground was cursed and thorns came up from the earth and God's harmony, his beauty was tarnished. It was all goofed up. And after Adam sinned, God could not look at the creation that he had and say, it's good because it was. 
It wasn't good. You ever wonder about tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes and, 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 and fires that are set by, by lightning? And, and you think, wow, why did God create that stuff? Why did God create that stuff? And I think, I, as I look back at Scripture, I said, I don't think God created that stuff. I think that that stuff happened as a result of sin that basically goofed up all of God's beauty and his plan for the world. I think these things are a result of, of the imbalance of nature, and they all came as a result of sin. Do you ever wonder why the animal world seems so vicious? You ever wonder why? Have you ever watched Discovery Channel and watch just the, that? I mean, we we my my wife and I had the privilege this year of going on safari, and and we watched uh, basically a, a leopard eat an antelope. You know, not cooked, but very raw. <laughs> But you watch just the viciousness of, 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 of the animal kingdom, and you think, oh my gosh, this is like crazy. They're crazy vicious. And you wonder why that is. And, you, and, and as I look at Scripture, I say, God did not make it that way. That's not how he made it. That's not how he intended it. And that's not how it longs to be. Creation wants to go back to how it was originally. In Isaiah chapter 11, this is what God says. This is how he created it. And this is what it's going to go back to. It says, the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed the bear. Uh, will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near the hole of a cobra. The young child will put its hand into a viper's nest and they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When the effects of sin are gone from this world, the world will go back to how God wanted it. You know, you, and, and so it's like creation is just longing, it's groaning to say, I want to get back to what God had intended. I want to get back what God had intended. <clears throat> Back to what this world was meant to be. But sin has disrupted this world that God created. Sin has disrupted the world in which God created. You know, we have a tendency at times to 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 view sin through tunnel vision, like 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 that that when we mess up, that it's only us. But we don't realize that all sin has a rippling effect even in creation. All sin. Doesn't matter. You know? It has it and, and I believe that this rippling effect also is is why some people are born deaf, some people are born blind, some people are born with with uh deformities, some people are born, you know, handicapped, disabled. Uh, because and not because those people are sinners, but because they're victims of a sin imbalanced creation that we live in. But notice in the scripture it says that all that that nature is groaning. It's groaning like in labor. So even though it's walking through the the the, the tragedies and the stuff that we see around us at times happening, yet yet creation, creation, all of creation is groaning as one it's expectant. As one, it's in labor. Somebody once asked me, he says, so why do women have a second child? <laughs> because they know the payoff at the end. They know that, that going through labor, they're going to get to hold that child. They're going to get to hold that creation. And they're excited about that. And that's how, it, that's how Paul says, that's how... Creation is right now waiting to be set free. The Bible says that the earth will be purified by fire through in First Peter chapter 3. And that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And that eventually there will be 
a, a, a glorious, great harmony of all of creation. But then, creation is not the only thing that's groaning. The believer groans as well. You and I groan all the time. He says in verse 23, he says, Not only so, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of the sons, the redemption of our bodies. For this is the hope. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes what he, for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. You know, there's a sense that we could say that we are saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. Jesus came down, he died for your sins. If you accepted that, and that's part of your life, you're saved. You are saved. But if you if you ever have an opportunity to go back and read uh, Romans chapter 6 through chapter 8, you realize that, one, there's even though you're saved, there's still a battle going on inside your body, right? There's still a battle for you to do what's right and wrong. There's still choices. Paul says there's a great battle going on. He says, man, who's going to deliver me? He says, because the battle is so great, there's a, there's a continuous learning how to walk with God on a daily basis and don't sin. All right? And that's, that, that's just struggle all of us face all the time. Because, cause, I mean, we don't know how to get up in the morning without screwing up. <laughs> no. Because we, we just, that, that's just part of our nature. We're just sinners. And so we think bad thoughts. We do wrong things, you know. And, 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 and so there's this groaning inside of us saying, gosh, I just want to be better. And like with Paul, when he says, man, who's going to deliver me from this? That groaning in, inside. You know, and so in a sense, we're in the process of being saved as we learn to walk in the holiness of, of God. <clears throat> and the Christian life is, is one where we can never say, I've arrived. Right? Because you know, you never have until you stand before Jesus. <laughs> you can say, I've arrived. All right? But that, that is the third sense in which, in which we, we, we are saved. We, we are being saved. And, and, and where, where we, we are, we, we, we have this fullness we have, are truly being yet saved when we get to heaven and all of a sudden God says, let me introduce you to my child. Because <laughs> that's what you are to God. You're his child. Like somebody said, I think it was Max Lucado said, if God had a refrigerator, you're picturing me on it. <laughs> you know, because that's how he sees each one of us. He's so in love with us. He cares for us so much. And that's part of the whole adoption process. That's what Paul is saying, you know, that we're adopted as these sons and daughters of God. And that part of that adoption, part of the adoptive process, is when the adoptive parent would stand that person who was adopted in front of a crowd and say, this is my child. And so at that time, that's when all of a sudden you'll say, wow, I am truly saved. I am full on saved by God. Ah, and that, that's, that's God's heart for us. Ah, and that's kind of, he says, it's kind of like the, the first fruit of what we're going to get, this, this offering. And, and um, that we are going to be stand before God and, and he's going to honor us. And he says, and the Holy Spirit they have is kind of a, 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 a indication that, 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 that that's really going to happen. And the Holy Spirit inside of our lives is that inner voice that says, honor God, pray, talk to God, love him. He loves you. It's that inner voice that says that. It's not the one that says, yeah, be mad at that person. It's okay. Not a problem. You know, you can hold resentment and bitterness towards them because they did something wrong to you. That's not God, right? That's not God talking. God's the one that says, Love, forgive, you know, 
Pray, come to know me. That's God. That's God. And that, that's that first fruit of, of knowing that one, I am saved because I hear that voice. I hear those things happening. And Paul says that, that is, 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 is part of our adoption. But we groan, we groan for a fullness to where all of a sudden, I groan when I sin. Do you guys groan when you sin? I groan when I sin. I just go, Jim, that was just stupid. Again. And I groan. But that's part of the spirit inside of us, just saying, you want something so much better because God wants something so much better for every one of us. And so we have aches and pains right now, but I groan to basically be be free from this world. Because this is in our home. We, we're, we, are, we are heading to be with our Heavenly Father, with Jesus who has prepared a place for us. We are heading there. This is a mission field right now. And we have aches and pains on here. Our, our, our earthly bodies are, 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 are rebels against God at times. And sometimes we get little maverick cells inside of us that cause cancer and all kinds of other horrible things. But when we get to heaven, we will be totally set free. There will be no limitations on us. And there's coming that day when we'll be free from sin, and I cannot wait for that day. I groan for that day. It says, then it says in verse 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. He who searches our hearts knows the minds of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And just as creation longs for new creation, and we long for the redemption of new bodies, the Holy Spirit longs and yearns for God to be totally manifested in us. And Jesus is up there praying every day for every one of us that God's will will be done in our lives. And when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit helps us without words. He helps us just because he knows what we need. <clears throat> when we're confused, the Spirit sees clearly. When we sin, the Spirit groans in us for freedom <clears throat> and for deliverance. In conclusion, let me suggest two things that we should take away from this passage. One, we need to understand that groaning is natural. Groaning is natural. Life hurts. Sometimes it seems arbitrary that some stuff happens to some people and it doesn't happen to others. But life, it doesn't make a mistake. You know, can you imagine how difficult it would be to be living in Gaza right now? I, I, I just I can't imagine it. I can't imagine just with, with it war-torn with tens of thousands of people on the verge of starvation. You know, with, with no real end in sight yet. And, just going, and you just think, wouldn't you just get tired of battling, battling all the time? You know, and you say, God, why do you allow these things? Why, why, why do you let this stuff happen? You know? <clears throat> And we say, God, this is not how it's supposed to be. And you know what God would say? That's right. Not how it's supposed to be. You say, God, why don't you do something about it? He says, I will. I will. I will. Sin has devastating effects, and war is part of sin's devastating effect. And am I saying the people in Gaza are bad because this is happening to them? No. No. It's not what I'm saying. There are many Christians who are living in Gaza right now, too, have been victimized, just like the non-Christians. It's not the sin in Gaza that is bringing this about, but it's the collective nature of the sin of mankind that is bringing this about. Is God powerless to stop these things? Nope. God could stop these things anytime he wants, but... In his sovereignty, he allows them to happen so that when we will get sick of them and begin to cry out to him. So when we see these horrible things in life happen, 
Paul's saying we need to groan. Groan, yearn for a better day. Look beyond the suffering <sighs> to what will happen to will endure forever. Second, we must not give up. Don't give up. The thing that sustains creation and other human beings is a thing called hope. Hope. We don't have hope in this world. We have hope in God. Our hope is not a wish or a, uh, 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 a desire. It's not like hoping for a pony on Christmas or something. But it's a confident expectation that we have. It's out of sight right now, but, but yet God, we, we believe in the one who holds our future in his hands. His name is Jesus. And so our hope is in that one, what he said, he will accomplish. And what he said was true. And we believe that because he rose from the dead. And nobody else has. So we believe it because even though he died, he rose. And we must never forget where we, each one of us, are headed. We're headed for heaven. We're headed for heaven. <clears throat> I think of what would happen if I thought more about heaven than I do about this earth. And I know we live here. we got to deal with this stuff all the time. You know, you guys got to get back to life here in Phoenix. We've got to drive home and get back to life in, in, in Southern California. And, 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 you know, we just, we have to deal with life. But what would happen if we just start talking about what it's going to be like? Heaven. What that's going to be like. We'll be free from all this stuff. Free from the worries. Free from the hassles. Free from the sin. Free from the, the sickness. Free from all of the pain and suffering that we deal with here. I think that we, our lives would change. I think that we would look forward to it more, desire it more, begin to say, God, let your kingdom come. Let it happen, God. Let it happen. Bring heaven down again to this earth. Let it happen here in Phoenix. Let it happen in Southern California, God. We, we groan, we yearn that you would do a work that would magnify your name in us and in their communities. So let's pray. Father, thank you that, um, Lord, we do. We long for something so much better. In our lives, God, in our community. <clears throat> something where you will be glorified, where God, our kids, learn to honor you with their lives, with their thoughts, where we learn to honor you with our words, with our thoughts, with our actions. Where people see Jesus in us. God, we long for uh, your return. Where you can uh, set free not only this world, and bring it back to your original plan. But God, where you can uh, bring us to be with you, where we'll see you face to face, where our bodies will be changed, transformed, where we will live in total, absolute freedom and wholeness. Thank you for loving us, God. Enough to give us your spirit that groans. Groans for more of you. I pray a blessed church here. Encourage the people here at Phoenix with your love, your mercy in Jesus' name.